Surprise! I uh, just thought for a few minutes, not a long run, <laughs> we could hang out for a little bit and chat about something that came in the uh, shipment today. So we'll see how many people notice this sneaky little stream of mine. <clears throat> and if no one notices, oh, somebody noticed. Hi, Ken. And you are first. <laughs> so today we are not wearing a microphone. I am just using the one in the room, so you guys have to let me know how this sounds. Hopefully it's good enough. Um, the tank is doing a little bit of noise in the background, but it's really minor because uh, it's the turf scrubber draining out the base. Um, so I won't... I read your message. <laughs> Uh, let's see. All right, so um, I wanted to share with you guys uh, a couple of things. Nothing major, nothing huge, but uh, you know, just interesting things. Uh, I stopped by the fish store today briefly. I walked in. I stayed away from any people just to pick up one thing for my tank. You know everyone's been worrying about toilet paper. I was able to get a roll of Clarice fleece for my fleece roller that probably has a couple of weeks left. So I was happy to get the last roll in stock. I actually tried to order it online because I didn't want to go anywhere. And they didn't have it in stock and I thought, hmm. So, fish store had one, so boom, got that. And then I received this shipment um, earlier today. And so I wanted to share that with you guys. I thought we could unbox it. Uh, but first, I wanted to show you this. So, this is a really, really wrinkled shirt. Uh, this was from Magna 2012, and it is crazy wrinkled on purpose, and I want to show you why it's wrinkled, and then I can just put it away. I've been leaving it out to show you guys for some time. Uh, so originally, that shirt was given away to people in 2012 in the shape of Texas. So the shirt is actually packed in here, and that's M for medium size, so there was large, there was small, and it was crammed into this little tiny thing, and then when I opened it up, and I'd never opened this, it ends up looking, you know, like a t-shirt, but it's super duper wrinkled. Now, I am assuming once it's been washed, it'll probably be completely normal, but it's never even been worn. It, I found it in the back room. I thought, oh, I got to show you guys on the stream because it was kind of funny to me. So, oh, maybe I'll throw it on. <laughs> it's brand new and it's eight years old. <laughs> Let's see if I can squish into it. All right, so uh, Macna 2012 was actually the Macna that I ran uh, with a couple of other uh, local club members, and we did this event for, um, you know, in Dallas, Texas. It was pretty cool. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me get a sip of my drink. Uh, you guys are always complaining I'm drinking coffee, so I thought tonight I'd drink something different. A little bit of Crown Royal, Ice Cube. Um... So, uh, oh, also, I shared a picture on Instagram, which has propagated to Facebook by now, and I don't know if you guys saw it, so I'll show you on my Instagram. We'll switch to this. So I picked up a new bag of carbon today. <laughs> Actually, this was delivered to my door. The uh, UPS driver was not happy to haul that up to my front door. That's 55 pounds of carbon. And I buy a bag of carbon about once every... Oh, I don't know, three, four years. And uh, that will be more than enough for a very, very long time. <laughs> so I just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, I got plenty of carbon. So, and uh, what, end, what I've done in the past is I've sold some of it. It's a really clean carbon. I get it from Blue Life USA. And they, uh, they use it for their ClearFX Pro. And because it's such a good carbon, I, I just buy one ginormous bag from them once in a blue moon. And then I repack it so it doesn't get ruined. Uh, by repacking it, I have to basically scoop out the carbon. Um, in, you know, I just use a cup and keep scooping and filling up Ziploc bags. Or I have these containers with a lid I can screw shut. And that way it stays dry and doesn't get loaded up with moisture you know, from uh, you know, just being ruined in uh, humidity. So I try to keep it all sealed and I just use it up. And I only use a half a cup per 50 gallons of water. So my... Uh, my reactor, I think I put in something like, 
I always try and do this math in front of cameras. I hate doing that. So a cup per hundred, two, four. I use about four and a half cups of carbon in my reactor, and that lasts for a few days. And then I don't do it again for a while, like almost a month. And it's time to do it again in my tank. I like to do that on a regular basis, and it's nice to have a ton of carbon on hand, so that way I don't have to sit there and worry about running out. <laughs> okay, so I want to tell you guys about this. This is new. It came from Brightwell. Um, what they've done is they've come up with a kit for those of you setting up a new tank that uh, you're using dry sand, you're using dry rock. And this has got all the stuff in there to actually cycle the tank, and it cycles the tank quicker than throwing in some raw shrimp and waiting for it to rot. Uh, the entire process should take about eight days according to the instructions on the package. So I thought we'd open up the box and just kind of show you guys what's in it. Uh, this retails for $30. And I am going to put it on my site because so many of you guys are starting tanks. Even though I've said this many times, I like to sell the things I use myself. I don't know when I'm ever going to set up a new tank. So this one, I'm going to have to act on faith and just trust that they're making a good product. They have a lot of good products. And I, when they said they came out with this, I thought that's good because a lot of people I know set up tanks with dry rock. So the kit comes the way you see it. It's got a little sticker on the bottom to show it's never been opened before. And here is my instruction sheet that I dropped instantly. So this describes what? Oh, okay. So this is showing all the products that they sell at Brightwell. And there are uh, a number of items on here on both sides. Okay. That was the first thing it shows. Then some bubble wrap. More bubble wrap. Okay, so there's three bottles in here. This is called Microbacter Quick Cycle, CYCL. And this is the actual ammonia, I believe. And then this is Microbacter Start XLM. And this is what you're going to use to actually create uh, bacteria in the tank. And then finally, you've got the Microbacter Clean, which you're going to use on a regular basis for uh, at least 12 weeks, but they actually recommend three to six months. And the idea is that by using these three products, let me grab the instructions here so they're in front of me. And actually, it says on the box to read the instructions on each bottle and follow it very closely. But right here on the front of the box, it also spells out some really good guidelines. And one of the things that it stated that was very adamant about was that this is for dry rock, not dry rock that's been seeded with bacteria. So if you bought like the, uh, I think they call it life rock from Carib Sea, this would not work well with life rock because it would be like competing bacteria. So they recommend that you only use it with totally dry rock like Marco rock, which is a very well-known popular type of rock that people often get um, online, you know, because it saves money. And then you're going to use the, you follow the instructions very carefully about how to dose the ammonia. And it talks about uh, dosing your tank to get around one or two PPM. And, uh, Anyway, I just thought, all right, I'm going to get this for the customer. So if that's something you're interested in, it'll be added to the site this week, and uh, it'll be available for you. The idea is that not only will it help you cycle your tank and get the new rock going, it also will kind of help with the ugly stages because of Microbacter Clean, which helps to keep the rock work cleaner. So you don't have to really uh, be upset with your tank going through these stages. It kind of just stays ahead of the game. Uh, it did mention that if you have a tank that you're using used rock from, so essentially live rock, that you can use this product with the live rock. But they were very adamant, don't mix it with other bacteria. This is just use this one, and don't put anything else in the tank. So I just wanted to show that to you and uh, kind of give you guys a little bit of a heads up. So I'll put these bottles right here. I know it's gonna be a little blurry in the background, but that's what's in the box. All right, let me see what you guys wrote. See, I'm not, I'm not going to be 20 minutes behind for once <laughs> on getting to your uh, comments. Let's see. It's kind of cool to wear this shirt. I'm never going to wear it again, but I want to wear it tonight. Mark after dark. Yeah, Jake, I saw them talking about it on the Apex live stream or uh, Neptune Systems live stream. They were doing Let's Talk Reef, and I was tuned in as well. I even did a watch party in the Club Mealers Reef to let others know there was a stream going on. And then we, uh, they actually mentioned my tank a couple times, which is kind of cool. And I loved when they said they looked at my permissions 
and said that I actually have mine set up correctly <laughs> because I trusted no one. And they said, Mark is the only one that has it set up correctly because we don't have the ability to go change things on this tank willy-nilly if we want to. And yeah, they're not supposed to be able to. You give that permission if it's needed, and then you shut that thing off. Just like anything you own, you don't just leave the front door open. So, let's see. Yes, Crisis. He says that uh, my role of clerisy is TP for the tank. <laughs> Not wrong at all. Um, oh, uh, so Myers Reef said, I'm just cleaning the old MP40s. That's great. And we should keep up with cleaning our different power heads in our tanks and uh, soaking them in something. And some people are adamant not to use white vinegar anymore, and they're suggesting citric acid. I've been buying citric acid now once or twice from Amazon. Actually, I'm all out. I need to buy another batch. And uh, I get this five-pound bag. I might get a ten-pound bag, so it lasts longer. And you uh, mix up basically a cup to a gallon of water and then soak whatever it is you're going to clean and then scrub it clean. And I found that to be really effective. There's no odor. It doesn't burn my hands like muriatic acid would do. Um, and there's no downside like there is apparently... There are some really staunch uh, believers that white vinegar causes chaos with plastic and rubber. But, I mean, we've, be, we've been using it for like 15 years, and somehow we made it this far in the hobby. But, anyway, um, I just want to let you know, yeah, it's good to clean it. Also, I did show on the live stream that I'm using a 3D printed cage on my MP40. And I guess I am going to order some of those because quite a few of you showed some interest and having the, the option to put that over your, your uh, power head. And the reason I like this one over the other one I've seen online is that this one has larger slits in the side instead of being those very tight. I've seen other covers that are 3D printed, and it's like a million tiny holes. It almost looks like a screen. And while I agree nothing get in, can get into it, I also wonder if it will restrict flow, especially as it gets dirty. You know, now if you're going to take it off every single week and clean it, yeah, it's fine. But I just, I saw that and I thought, man, I would not want that <laughs> as a personal choice. Now, I haven't run it, so I'm being very biased, but I'm all about flow in the tank. And my my big tank, my 400-gallon reef, there's two MP60s and MP40, and there's no covers on any of those. But I have a cover on the one in the anemone cube because of the anemones. So uh, I'm thinking about putting one on the MP40 behind the sea bay. That's sea bay is almost never out of where it is. I mean, you guys have seen it pretty much on the same spot for years. There was a couple of times in all these years where it's moved, and I put it right back in that spot. But it never went toward the MP40, so I don't sense a risk. But I kind of thought, you know, I could put the exact same 3D printed cover on that one as well. Why not? If anything, the cover will prevent algae, I think, from growing within the MP40 because it is being you know, kind of shaded by all this plastic. But uh, I obviously, I don't want to restrict the flow at all. And so uh, I like the one that's being 3D printed by... Um... <laughs> it would help if I remember the name of his company. I'm sorry, guys. I'll tell you guys later. Um, but he's printed the ones for the Nero 5 pumps. And now he's doing the ones for the MP40 and probably the MP10. And I don't think he'll do the MP60 because it's such a big pump. It might be bigger than his 3D printer can design. So... Um... It's something interesting. <laughs> uh, James said he was talking about my bag of carbon. Such a small bag. Uh, XJet says, do you still have the Versa singles in stock? Yes, the Versa pumps, I have about eight of those in stock. I have quite a bit of inventory in stock, and I do have inventory coming in from some companies. But there are certain companies that are absolutely closed and no inventory is leaving. Uh, Neptune Systems is closed until April 6th. I believe Ecotech is closed down for the time being, so nothing is coming out of there. Uh, I'm going to reach out to Coralview to see what they've got going on, because that's one of my suppliers, and see if I can get some more things in. I'd like to get more Camor pumps in as well, because I know you guys like the Camor, and others are liking the Versa. They like the flexibility of the, both choices. But, um, and you know, my acrylic supplier, uh, this is a quick little story. So I placed an order on Friday for delivery on Monday. And I said, you know, I need, you know, seven sheets of quarter inch. I need two sheets of three eighths. I need a sheet of black acrylic. 
And he says, no problem, we're open for business, we'll deliver on Monday. So on Monday, ding dong, the truck is here at my place. I open the door and he says, I'm here, um, let's unload it. By the way, some of your acrylic is on back order. And I was thinking, what are you talking about? And I look at the piece of paper <laughs> and my seven sheets of, of clear acrylic, my quarter inch acrylic, that is what I use for almost everything. I got one sheet. And I thought, well, that's going to last two days. What am I supposed to do with that? And it just showed back order for the rest. And I said to him, well, when is the rest coming in? And he said, you'll have to talk to your salesman. So we unloaded the truck, got everything in the workshop. And then he left and I called him up and I said, so I was missing some of my inventory. I'd like to know what's going on. And he said to me that we don't know when we're going to have more. And I said, well, what do you mean? You don't, you have zero idea? And he's like, no, we, we really don't. It's, it's a huge question. I was like, well, this is bad because my thought was, number one, I sell inventory out of the shop. And then when I run out of those things, at least I can build things out of acrylic so I can keep paying the bills. And I thought, so that'll kind of be okay. And then, so that was kind of like my backup plan, if that kind of makes sense. And I was thinking, this is not good. And I, I sat here at the desk for about 10 minutes thinking about the situation and then it dawned on me, well, there are competitors in Dallas that sell acrylic. And so I called another company that I used to do business with years ago. And I said to them, do you have any quarter inch cast acrylic uh, paper backing clear in stock? And he says, we've got plenty. And I said, well, how much is plenty? Because, you know, and he says, 200, 300 sheets. <laughs> I was like, all right, now we're talking. So I had a truck uh, show up. And so I set up an account instantly, paid for the order over the phone. And today another truck showed up. And we loaded up my workshop with another eight sheets of acrylic. So now I'm good for a few weeks, which is excellent um, because I want to keep working. You know, I mean, they say work from home. Well, that's what I do best. <laughs> so I was really happy that I thought of an alternative because mostly I've got friends that don't recommend this at all. You know, they say, hey, you find a, a supplier, then you find a better supplier and you're constantly, you know, rotating through suppliers. And I'm, I don't run my business that way, and I'm probably doing it wrong. But I, I'm more about loyalty, and I just stay with the same supplier forever until they close their doors. And just I'm just dependable. You know, They can guarantee that I'm going to pay them. They are going to supply me. They take good care of me. If there's any issues, we handle it. And it's worked out really well. And so I don't just go through a new supplier every nine months or something. And uh, it's... It, I like that, you know, I, I like that I know the same people that I've been working with them for 15 years, you know. So uh, in a way, to ask another supplier for acrylic almost feels a little bit weird for me internally. But at the same time, I just had to do something. Um, and in a pinch, you, you do it. And you know what? The funny thing is, the price of the acrylic was about the same. Uh, I expected... You know who I've been with for so long. They're, they're you know I would like to think they're giving me a great price, and so I thought, well, I'm a new customer for this other company. Even though I used to be a customer there as years ago, they used to be located in Fort Worth, and I used to drive there to pick up acrylic. But it's been so long, I'm not even in their computer anymore. Anyway, I thought, well, you know, I'll probably get a certain price range, and as I buy more stuff, they'll give me a better. And actually, they, their price was almost the exact equivalent to what I was paying to the first supplier. So it, that was kind of a wash, which was great. Um, and uh, I was happy to get, you know, a bunch of acrylic in. I mean, I spent $1,000 in acrylic today. What did you guys buy? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, the light just turned off on the reef, so now it's down to pure blue light. Give me a quick look. Well, you can't really see it. The webcam never looks good, but uh, ugh, there's like a smudge on the buttons. Um, let's see if my phone will get it. My phone will probably be even worse because I've got the clip-on thing far away. And I'll do this, see what this does for you guys. No, it doesn't turn. Never mind. That would be a terrible idea. You guys know I hate vertical video. All right, we'll keep going here. Ooh, apple pie moonshine. That sounds good. All I have was some Crown Royal. Um, I started getting a video in Final Cut Pro, so I've got it laid out, and I've got to start compiling it, and I hope to release a video tomorrow night. Um, I'm working tonight, 
Um, I'm just going to be on here for a little bit, then I have to get some work done. And then tomorrow I'm going to do what I can. Um, hours are being abbreviated now because, like, for example, FedEx is closing earlier than usual. And uh, so if I can't get the order to them in time, it doesn't go out. I got out about 18 or 19 orders today. I was so tired. <laughs> I, I posted a picture of a whole bunch of boxes that went out, uh, lots of little things. And uh, it takes time. I mean, everything takes time. And I, I get zero rest, it seems like. Honestly, I feel like I'm just going, going, going. And uh, I'd rather, you know, just rest tonight. But I have to work. I have to glue some things so it can cure. And uh, then tomorrow I cut out more stuff. Um, I did want to tell you guys that Andrea sent me a whole list of uh, people getting the Coral Magazine from last Saturday. So those will probably go out in the mail in the next two days. I have to put them all in envelopes and I have to you know, label them and then uh, drop them up at the post office in person. I have to weigh each one and put a price on, you know, a, a, a special stamp on each one to get it out. And so that'll go out, um, like I said, probably in a couple of days. Um... John says, any chance you have your videos in a podcast stream? No, I don't. Not yet. I've talked about it a, a few times, but it hasn't happened. Not yet. Uh, some people, there is like a thing. You can Google this and you'll find a thing that converts YouTube into an MP3. And it'll convert the file and then you put that file on your phone or your device or whatever it is you want. And that way you can go ahead and you can listen to the show. But then you can't see anything. But again, you might be driving and you want to just listen. So that makes sense. And I do not, I have not stopped touching my face. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but everything itches all the time. So I'm doomed. I'm doomed, I tell you. So it's good that we have these videos on YouTube because when I'm gone, you'll still be able to play those back. I know, that's really dark. Um, Drama says, Nero 5 Snail Guards, also Nero 3 and Nero 7. Any word on release? Actually, I don't know anything about the three or the seven, so I need to find out about those before I can say anything about a guard. Um, that's uh, news to me. I kept hearing like rumors. I haven't heard anything official, and I didn't know to go look for it. So I will dig into that and find out what's going on. Let's see. Mina says, a three-month-old aquarium, phosphate is 0.2, and I have cyanobacteria. Should I let it ride and do its thing, or should I mix, use a mix of phosphate RX and cyano RX and chemiclean? Well, don't use all of those. I mean, pick one. Choose your battles. I would use chemiclean or red cyano RX, you know, one of those two, and use that to kill the cyano in three to five days. And once it's gone, you'll feel a lot better. Your phosphate level is totally fine. There is nothing wrong with that number. It's a little bit higher than people like, but it's nothing to panic about. And uh, when you treat your tank to kill off the cyanobacteria, you'll be very happy. Your tank will be cleaner. Basically, like I said, it, it could be gone in three days, but it may take as many as five. But after that, it's gone. And then you have many more weeks ahead of you of nice tank to look at. So, yeah, don't ride it out because it's not going to fade away on its own. You're just going to be looking at it. It's going to be bothering you for six months if you ignore it. Uh, Josh says, I have some slight scratches in my front glass. They are getting algae in them, which is exactly where they grow first. When algae grows on the glass, it grows in the cracks. It's crazy. I believe it's probably because that section of the glass isn't smooth. It's actually kind of, you know, it's jagged within the actual uh, scratch, and so it adheres in there. You're going to have to scrub it out. It's going to be a pain in the butt. There, are, you know, you can use like a credit card or a razor blade to kind of chip at it, but it's always going to be a problem. It's why we try to avoid scratching our tank at all costs because it's as soon as algae gets in it, it becomes an eyesore, and you're looking at your tank, and there's like this thing in there, and then you're taking a picture, and you can see a line in there, and it's ugly. So, but no, there's there's not anything like you you can do to like polish it out. It's just unfortunate. So try not to get any more scratches. You know, if you have one or two scratches, that's just what it is. You'll just have to focus on them. Basically, stay ahead of the algae. Don't let it grow uh, for multiple days. You know, you see, you know, if you can hit it and swipe it down, you're going to be ahead of the game. And then, you know, if you don't deal with the tank for a few days and it starts to build up, you know, scratch it off with a uh, not a scrubby, nothing sharp, 
but uh, you can use a, a brand new flat razor blade or you can use a, a hotel key card or a gift card, some kind of credit card, and you can scrub away at it until you get rid of as much of the line as possible. You can also try the Magic Eraser, which is uh, by Mr. Clean, but make sure you get the original one. Do not get their new and improved one that has additives inside of it. You just want pure uh, uh, Magic Eraser. It'll say, it'll say the original right on the package. Uh, Brian says, how, how quick do you think you could make me a fish trap? Are there different sizes besides just based on tank size? I have a fish with it, and I now have to catch all the fish in my quarantine. Actually, Brian, I answered your message actually on Facebook, uh, where you posted originally, and I was saying what you should do is just drain as much of the water out of the tank as possible, scoop out all the fish, and put, pump the water back into the tank. Just be done with it, because trying to trap them one by one, it's, it's just too much effort. <laughs> uh, now, how quick I can do it, I can't do it quickly. I actually have kind of a backlog of orders right now, and I am in my brain mentally trying to knock them out as quickly as I can. Uh, and so, no, there will be a wait. I do make different size traps. I make vertical ones, horizontal ones, um, but there's a wait. And so, like I was suggesting, if you can just pump out as much of the water, you know, get down to like two inches of water above the sand, the whole process will take maybe 15 minutes or so if you do this, and you don't have to change your rock work or anything because the fish will scoot out. They'll be like salamanders in the water, and you can just scoop them out one by one. You can scoop them into a glass. You can scoop them up with a net, um, and then you just fill the tank up with water again and pump it right back in. It's, it's that quick. Oh, thank you, Keith. Yeah, um, he was... Yeah, whenever you guys ask a question, because the chat ends up with a lot of people talking to each other as well as talking to me, use at Milo's Reef, so I will, because that's how I'm looking for your questions. Uh, he's absolutely right. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, Nozilla says, what are you using to cut your sheets of acrylic? I have a CNC machine named Minion, and I've been cutting uh, acrylic on it for over three years now, and it basically I design everything on this computer that you're on right this moment. And then I put it onto a thumb drive and I take it into a standalone computer in the workshop that is not connected to the world. No Wi-Fi, no Ethernet. It's literally, it's a doomsday device. <laughs> Think of a Faraday cage. It's like that. Nothing can get on that computer. No virus can get on that computer. I mean, and I'm going from Mac to PC. So really, there is very little likelihood I'll ever infect it with anything. But I just, I, that computer can't get updates. I mean, it literally is... a a, a dinosaur because you need a very old computer to talk to my CNC machine and the uh, the tool you know so that's how it works and once it's programmed then it starts cutting and something I've been doing recently is I will do a test cut which I never did in the past I just cut and whatever happened happened but I'm tired of wasting the big sheet of uh, MDF that's underneath the acrylic because it if it cuts too deeply it leaves grooves and when you have grooves in the surface the acrylic doesn't stay in place as easily and it can slide right off the, uh, the the backer board basically and so instead I and then what the cure is to plane the surface of the entire table to get it nice and smooth and then you have to reset the height of the router bit you have to measure all that you have to do your cuts again so anyway I have gotten I'm being a little bit more um, I guess the best word is anal <laughs> Uh, I'm being really picky about my cuts so I don't ruin the backer board. So I will, like today I told it, cut out these pieces. And I cut out one piece of acrylic, just one little you know, rectangle. And then I checked it, and it wasn't deep enough. So I adjusted my number, you know, like a hundredth. And I told it, cut it again, and it was a hundredth lower. And then I hit it again with another hundredth, and another, until I finally found that sweet spot that I know is exactly right for this bit on that planed surface. And uh, now I was able to cut out stuff this afternoon without damaging the table whatsoever, which is great. You know, I mean, why have damage when you can avoid it? So the hassle factor is that I have to run it two or three times to nail it, to get it just right. But then once I got it, I can just keep going with that for a couple of weeks, which is great. And while I was doing all of this, I put a brand new router bit on there. <laughs> I don't know how old that last router bit was, but it was cutting... And the shavings were like snow, you know, just kind of clunky and chunky and big, right? This new one, the shavings come off as like dust. I'm like, oh, I totally forgot about dust. This is fantastic. So I went ahead and I set it up. It was cutting. I, 
I told it to drill me a little tiny uh, half inch hole in the corner here and I just wanted to see if it would puncture through the paper or if I could stop at the paper. And then after I did the hole, I was like, okay, that looks pretty good. And I lifted the sheet and it was zero damage to the backer board. And I was very pleased with myself. <laughs> it's not very often I'm pleased with myself. So, you know, that was really nice. Uh, Nozilla, I have not tried the Crown Royal Maple yet. I thought you have to go to Canada to do that. Let's see. <laughs> Beast Speaks says, geez, man, hitting the booze and sleeping in your clothes. I know it does look like I've been sleeping in this. Um, it's uh, this is this is what we live in now. This is COVID nineteen. Uh, Kevin, I have not done that much. I've done a few videos where I'm around the machine. The machine makes a lot of noise, so to stream around the machine is kind of be kind of hard. I mean, I could just show it happening, but it's kind of boring. You know, just imagine the machine's running for a couple of hours. Every time you look over, it's still cutting. <laughs> it's still working on something. And uh, there's that. And there's me getting up and down. I mean, like, you know, I work in my home. And today, my watch says that I've walked 4.2 miles. It's unbelievable. I do not have that big a house. So um, I'm back in and out. I'm back and forth constantly. I'm moving things around. I'm adjusting things and I have to edge things and get them cleaned up so that they're uh, ready for gluing and then there's the gluing process everything takes time and I don't think just to kind of see it through a blurry camera you know because I just feel like live stream cameras are never focused enough you know you can't see the detail and when I glue clear acrylic to clear acrylic with clear solvent it's like water against water against water you can't see anything so there's really no upside or benefit to showing that so I've done a couple of actual close-up videos where you got to see a few little, you know, like a like a sampler of what I do, but not like a full-blown here. I'm building a sump because it goes on, you know, building a sump is not something you do in a day. It actually takes a couple of days to do the entire process, maybe three, and nobody's going to stream for three days. You know, I, I'm not going to. Plus, I've got phone calls I got to take. So a lot of times the TV is on in the background or I have music playing, and anything that you're running in the background that is. Uh, Copywritten, you get in trouble with YouTube. So I'm very picky about what I use. I released a video about ORA with a soundtrack in the background that you can barely hear that was specifically on YouTube that says copyright free, you can use in your videos. And it's that video still exists to this day with that soundtrack. And yet I just recently got dinged with it, which means they took off monetization off this old video. And uh, it's not the end of the world, but it was annoying because I was like, I did not take your song it's some kind of a remix that's right here. But the company that uh, filed the claim, they apparently said, nope, that's our song. <laughs> and I was like, you know what, whatever. The video was four years ago. Have at it. You know, take, get your nickels and dimes. You know, so be it. Um, Alex says, when polishing acrylic, what do you recommend? I'm getting ready to polish a 48 by 36 by 24, 200-gallon tank, and plan to sand it with 3K or 3,000 grit paper and then use Novus. Um, actually, the whole polishing thing is a real art. And I'm sure there are some videos that you could watch on YouTube. I don't have any that talk about it because I always use new acrylic. I just never fix acrylic. It's just too much trouble. But that being said, I totally get what you're doing. And there are people that do that and they go from different grits. Um, they could start out with something as low as 1200 grit and work their way all the way up to like 6000 grit. And uh, then they're using Novus uh, 1, 2, and 3 to really get that beautiful shine. It's a lot easier to polish the outside of a tank than it is to do the inside. And I've seen people do it, and I'm always like, wow, my hat's off to you because that was a lot of work. It is a huge undertaking. I'm not trying to talk you out of it. I'm just saying, you know, it's good that you have a lot of free time right now because <laughs> you can just work on this thing indefinitely. And uh, you're going to need to wear a face mask, and not because of disease, but because of the dust. You don't want to inhale that stuff nonstop because you'll be doing it for a while. But uh, I really don't have any great advice for you. Matter of fact, I've several times I've asked different acrylic uh, manufacturers that I'm friends with, what do you use? And of course, they always tell me and I never memorize it because I don't work with damaged stuff. I always buy brand new sheets and I use it and I do my best to not let anything happen to it before it goes out the door. 
but it would be really handy if I knew more because occasionally something happens I'd love to fix a blemish. But that's one of the reasons I don't make display tanks because everyone's super picky about the display. The display has to be perfect. And, uh, you know, if they saw stuff on there, they'd be like, oh, this is horrible. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. That's why I don't do it. <laughs> I focus on everything goes underneath. There's a little bit of room for error down there. Hey, George, nice of you to chime in from Sydney. I, I'm hearing that you guys are getting just as hammered with this virus as we are. Uh, someone shared with me, a friend of mine from Australia, shared with me a video in Messenger, which I hate because... When it's in Messenger, once the video's there, you can't share it back out to Facebook. You can only give it to another person in Messenger. So it's it, you, it's the opposite of viral. You can send it to you know a few friends, and they can show it to a few friends, and it just kind of disappears. And it was a, a woman that worked in the healthcare, and she was telling everyone, stay home. And uh, she's, she said, you know, this is deadly. And I mean, she was really adamant. You know, it went on for like five minutes. I watched the whole rant <laughs> because, you know, I get it. I, I think it's really important. I know there's some people out there that are trying to downplay this thing. I think it's huge. I think it's a big, big disaster. And uh, I'm hoping for the best, but I'm very worried for the future. So anyway, I hope you guys are safe down there. Um, core... Pamanu says, what do you think of the max spec LED 200 watt uh, light? Um, we want to start with some SPS. We're thinking of adding some T5s to make it a hybrid. Would this help with growth? Actually, it will. So no matter what light you get, if you add T5s, you basically are going to eliminate the shadowing that happens with, the many, with many different brands of light fixtures. And so that's why people are doing these hybrid kits. They like to flood the tank with fluorescent, um, you know, the T5 bulb. And then they have the LEDs for the intensity and between the two, they get you know a lot of good growth, and they get some really cool coloration. So yeah, that could be a really nice thing. And I think Aquatic Life is one of the companies that makes that T5 hybrid. Um, I'm sure ReefBright has a, a hybrid because they actually make T5 bulbs. As a matter of fact, if you're looking at T5s, uh, I, I always talk about ReefBright. They don't pay me anything, but I just do. I, I really like the company. I like the owner, and so I talk about his lights all the time. They have their own specific brand of T5 bulbs that run cooler than everyone else's T5 bulbs. And the benefit of their bulb running cooler, not getting overheated, is it lasts longer than all the other bulbs. And that is a huge selling point to me because I know with fluorescent bulbs, we have to replace them pretty regularly. Um, nine months maybe uh, is usually the average time for running a T5 bulb and after that you gotta replace it. And with a Reef Bright, you might be able to go a year 15 months, maybe as much as 18 months because they run cooler. I mean, it's amazing the difference. And yet they look fantastic. I saw him at Macna and, and he told me, you know, touch the reflector. I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> and he's like, no, seriously, touch it. I'm like, no. And he's like, Mark, it's okay. You can put your hand on there. I want to show you something. So of course, you know, I put my fingertip on there. I was like, yeah, huh. And he said, and I, I could actually put my hand on it, but that light has been on for X amount of hours, like four hours. And it was just warm. It wasn't hot. And I mean, I've had to help people with T5 lights before. I remember somebody says, hey, I need to change all these bulbs. Can you help me? And they were blazing, blistering hot. I couldn't believe how hot they were. I was like, holy crap, I can't even touch this to remove the bulb. And, you know, we had to find gloves or towels or something to get those bulbs out. And with these ones from uh, Reef Bright, wow, such a difference. Now, obviously, the bulb itself is hot, but I'm talking about the reflector itself, which is another piece of metal. It wasn't hot. It was really, really neat. Um, Hala says, is there one coral or two that you dislike in your tank that you could remove? Um, you would. Um, well, I have one that just died recently, so I dislike it. <laughs> and I will remove it because it's just a dead skeleton on the end of my tank right now, kind of in a prime location. That thing went up in smoke. I don't know why. It just did. It's kind of a bummer and needs to be replaced. But, uh, I guess Pavona... Pavona is a really nice encrusting coral, and I've got, uh, I had a rock near the top of the tank that when we were re, uh, redoing it a couple years ago with Dwayne, and he goes, oh, that's got Pavona, and I was like, I don't care, I like Pavona, and he's like, no, it's it's horrible, it's the weed of the of the, you know, the reef tank, and so anyway, you know, I ignored it, of course, you know, because that's me, and the, 
uh, Pavona has been growing up on the acros and going up the side of the acropora, and it's kind of murdering the acropora so it can be more of itself. And that's kind of a problem spot now. And when, when and if Dwayne ever comes to visit me, he's going to see it, and I'm going to be in trouble. Because <laughs> I didn't get rid of it when he told me to. And uh, so I guess that one would be one. But it's a really nice coral, and it would be great to grow up the overflow box. But not have it on your prized real estate in your tank. That's not the spot to have it. And then I have uh, some um, Palithoa polyps, which are the toxic kind to kill you. And I've got a patch I need to remove, and I just haven't wanted to get my arm wet. But at some point, I'm going to have to get my arm wet. Uh, Danny says, what trace elements should I be dosing for good coral health? The term trace elements is actually a bunch of different elements in a bottle. And uh, there are different brands that make it. Kent makes trace elements. Brightwell has trace elements. Um, I think Two Little Fishies does. So you have choices of what you want to use from different companies. And you just have to decide, you know, what you want to add. Uh, myself, I don't actually dose a specific trace element. I... I know the trace elements are in the water changes, but I don't change water, so technically I should be deficient in a lot of areas. But when I sent in my water for an ICP test last year, uh, there was no real big lacking of anything in my tank that showed up. So between using Prodibio and using magnesium and having the media for the calcium reactor, and uh, you know I've put in live rock and hands, and you know I use phosphate or you know which has nothing to do with uh, trace elements. But my point is, I put those things in the tank, and my numbers seem to be okay. Now, when I talk with other reef keepers, like oh, I put it in every single week. I mean, they swear by it. So there's, it's not like a wrong thing to put in. Uh, I just, uh, I personally have, in all the years I've been in the hobby, I've never specifically chosen to put in trace elements other than maybe my first year when I didn't know what I was doing and I just did what the fish store told me to do. But like I said, I mean, we know a lot more now and uh, even companies like Red Sea have like a whole line of bottles of things you can pour in that they swear will make your, your reef tank glow with color. So, you know, I, any of that could work for you. Um, I can't read this name. He says, what do you think about Chinese filters and membrane for an RO unit? Please, your thoughts. Well, um, I sell RODI systems, and uh, so I recommend the filters and membranes that I sell. And they are made in different parts of the world. I don't believe any of my things are made in China. I think they're made in Taiwan or elsewhere. Uh, matter of fact, the membranes might be coming from somewhere here in the U.S. So uh, that's what I recommend. But I understand, uh, you know, that there's a lot of options out there, lots of choices. Um, that's the best I can do for you on the answer to that question. Uh, FloatServe says, can I mix uh, bicarbonate with soda ash? Is there a point where elk demands are so high that soda ash would boost pH too much and bicarb would be better? It's very, very rare that someone needs to lower their pH. You know, if you are now, okay, so let's put a caveat on that. pH takes care of itself in most tanks. Tanks may run lower because there's not enough fresh air and CO2 is so high in the home, especially now with everyone staying home with our pets and everyone's breathing around the tank and the pH drops in the tank. So that's why we talk about bringing in fresh air or running a CO2 scrubber, but that helps bring up the pH some. If you are adding pH plus which is an actual product made by I don't know who and you kept putting that every day because you're trying to be 8.3 8.3 8.3 8.3 8 if you finally stop doing that and take an alkalinity test kit out you might find out your alkalinity is like 17 because you're using this pH buffer on a regular basis to hit some magic number that you want to hit because you've been told 8.3 is where you need to be the my reef tank runs 7.9 to 8.1 every single day and everything in the tank looks good I mean, it's not perfect, but it, it's a very healthy reef. And, you know, most people that come over, they're like, wow. So I'm assuming it's fine. But if you um, are using... There are a few people that may be running pH that's so high that are like 8.5, 8.6 on a regular basis. They do not want to use... Um, an alkalinity that incre increases pH. 
So that's why they go to the other one, to the bicarbonate instead of the soda ash. I hope I'm saying that right. I think it's the carbonate that is uh, the one that's lower, and then bicarbonate is soda ash. I think I've got that right. I always have to look that up to make sure I say it right. Whatever it is, it's the opposite. Very few people need the opposite. Most of us need the soda ash to maintain alkalinity and pH together. Now, pH is taken care of automatically when your calcium, your magnesium, and your alkalinity, and your salinity, and your temperature are all correct. If you get those five things correct, pH is going to be whatever it's going to be. And you can do things to make it a little bit better. Like I said, fresh air, a CO2 scrubber, uh, dripping in caulk washer late at night. These are all things that help bring it up a little bit. But uh, most people do not need to worry that they're adding too much pH when they're doing their alkalinity dosing. It's very rare. And uh, there's a ESV came out with B-Ionic a long time ago. That's what I used to use. And I accidentally bought the wrong kind. And when I bought it, you know, I was buying it in bulk. And you get this huge bucket with like this much liquid. And then you add a whole bunch of RO water. And as soon as I mixed it up, I realized I had the wrong kind. And I contacted them and they said, you can't return it. <laughs> and I was like, no. And they're like, yeah, you can't. I mean, you've mixed it up with water. You can't even ship it back. It's too heavy now. And I was like, man. And I was like, what am I going to do with this stuff? And I ended up throwing it away because there was nothing I could do. It did not benefit my tank, and so I couldn't use it. And no one in my club needed it. I tried, and no one wanted it. <laughs> it was a mistake. I made a mistake. You know, lost a little bit of money. Uh. Um... Mr. Reef Buster says, I have a 150 watt heater for my 25 gallon Nano with an Inkbird controller. I can't seem to get the water temperature over 77 degrees. Do I need to get another, you know, another heater with higher wattage or secondary 150 watt? No, you have way more heat than you need. 25 gallons is a 75 watt heater. That's all you need, three watts per gallon. So, okay, let's talk about what's going on. How um, cold is the room the tank is in? You know, if the tank, if the room is 60 degrees or so, it's gonna be really hard to keep the tank at 78, for example, or 79. Um, let, but let's say the tank is in a normal room that's around 72 degrees. It should not be a problem. So because this is a nano, I'm wondering if maybe the flow going behind the tank, you know, moving from the back to the front, isn't moving quickly enough so the heated water isn't getting into the tank. I'd also think about just running the heater without the ink bird and just see how it works that way. Uh, it could be the controller is a problem. Like there's something wrong with the controller. It's not working right. I would start with a heater and just do a test for today or tomorrow morning when you're awake all day and you can keep an eye on the tank and just set the thing to the, the temperature you want and keep an eye on it. See when the light turns on, see when the light turns off, see what the temperature of the tank is. But 150 watts is double the amount of heat you need for that size tank. So it shouldn't be a factor. But I don't see you needing another heater. <laughs> uh, if the tank is sitting under an air conditioner vent, if the... Uh, Tank is by an open window where cold air is blowing in. I mean, these are things that could affect it, or even if it's near a really cold window, for example, where it's just like, you know, the refrigeration's coming off the glass, so to speak. I mean, these are things that can help cool a tank a little bit, but you have plenty of heat. So I don't know if the ink bird is working correctly, if you've got it set correctly, if the heater's turning on like it should. It could be the ink bird's set correctly and the heater's not set correctly, because you have to give it a little more oomph so it will be on when the ink bird calls for it. Take a look at that. See if maybe that's what's going on. Let's see. John says, does gluing of the acrylic affect your tanks with all the fumes in the house? I've had this argument with my wife about wallpaper plugins and air fresheners. These are valid questions. Uh, for example, I mean, I've got a lot of vapors in this room, you know, from what I work with, yes. But there's also, when you're doing things in the fish room itself, like when I was cleaning the poly tank with acid, I would put the lid on there to trap the acid within there as I washed the poly tank out so that the fumes wouldn't be inhaled by the protein skimmer. And if I was painting the floor in the fish room, which I need to desperately do, I would also shut off the skimmer so it doesn't inhale the fumes of the paint. But, uh, and these air fresheners and hairsprays and all the things that women like to use, these, I mean, you know, that's not being sexist. That's reality. Um, those, if they're near the tank, it can affect a tank. So it is a valid question, but I have not encountered anything. The, the stuff I glue acrylic together with, 
is pretty toxic stuff. I mean, it, it's got all the warning labels that it'll kill me on the jar, and I just use it. <laughs> but uh, I haven't noticed any problems, and I've been working with acrylic now. I mean, I work with acrylic daily um, for the past 10 years, and before that I did it part-time. But I've always worked inside my, this living room, actually. Uh, it's always been inside because I can control the climate, the humidity, the temperature. And so I do it here rather than outside or in the workshop. I do all the, the prep work out there, and then all the gluing happens in here. And you've seen my reef growing for years in this stuff, so it, that's not a factor. But I don't, I'm not a big fan of, like, the scented candles or the Glade plugins, you know, those kind of things. Matter of fact, they kind of bother me, which is ironic, because the fumes coming off of this acrylic when I'm gluing it, they're potent. And yet, if I have one of those plugins in my bathroom, I'm like, oh. so I just unplug it and leave it unplugged. And it was just a few days ago, I was like, you know, I haven't plugged that thing in in like seven months. I'm going to go ahead and plug it in, you know, just to kind of freshen up the room. I was cleaning everything with bleach because we're all on chaos mode right now. And I plugged that in, and it was a couple hours later, I was like, oh, and I unplugged it again. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really far from my tank. I mean, it's the other end of the house. So, uh, yeah, valid question, but no, I haven't seen any kind of issue. So uh, I guess the stuff I use doesn't hurt reefs. Uh, Cameron says, do, you, do any of you have a problem with the flipper magnet scrubber scratching your glass. The flipper cleaning magnet does have a metal blade and I used it on several of my tanks and unfortunately it did scratch my tanks but I use Starfire glass which is the softest glass on the planet and I'm super picky about what I use on the glass and he sent it out to me and he says I want you to try it out Mark and I said it scratched my glass and he was like no I was like yeah I said I'm not going to use it and he said a hundred thousand people have used it and they're so happy. I want you to be happy. I'm like, well, I appreciate that. And, and I want to be happy too. <laughs> I said, but it just didn't work for my tank. Um, if I had just a regular uh, iron glass tank, probably would have been no problem at all. But because I have low iron, super, super soft glass, it's very susceptible. It's it's better than acrylic. Acrylic scratch is super easy. But um, it's uh, it did get scratched. I was like, ah. So if you have a Starfire tank, you know, it might not be the best choice, but there's other people out there that swear work perfect for them. Maybe they're less picky than I am. I mean, I, I know every scratch on my tank. And I've had my tank for six and a half years. I've had the Anemone Cube for six and a half years. And the scratches are on there. I know when they happened. I know what caused them. And I do my best not to add one more scratch to the collection. <laughs> Um, James says, would you consider making a 48 by 48 by 12 inch deep frag tank? Yeah, I could do it. It'd be hard, <laughs> I, but I could do it. Let me see what the uh, gallons are for that. Because I have a feeling that's uh, over 90 gallons. 119 gallons, yeah. So that has to be made out of uh, 3 8 acrylic to be strong. Um, it, will, it cannot be rimless. It has to have a, a flange on the top so that it won't bow outward, and uh, it's a lot of money. I mean, ballpark, you're looking at maybe around $1,400 or more for that size tank. Tim says, did you spend time in Switzerland? It's incredibly beautiful. If you did, tell us about it. Okay, so uh, story time. Uh, I actually lived in Switzerland for three years, and I loved it. And uh, I went to school there. I learned German. I was little, and uh, I have a lot of family in Switzerland. And so, uh, you know, if I had a choice, I'd be living there now. But my life has me where I am now, and I'm still here in the U.S. <laughs> but technically, I'm actually half Swiss. And so uh, the only thing I don't have is Swiss citizenship. But no, the country's gorgeous. I love the transport, the public transportation they have there. Uh, I love the shops. Uh, I love that you can go everywhere so quickly. You know, here in Texas, if I want to leave Texas and I'm going toward California, I am going to be driving as fast as I'm legally allowed. Plus, uh, you know, I'm going to go faster. Uh, nine hours to get to El Paso, <laughs> and I'm still in Texas. And where in Switzerland, you'd already be, you know, in Germany and in halfway into Poland in nine hours or something. You know, I mean, you could you can jump countries. 
and you know there's trains that go everywhere and the view is fantastic and I love the weather there. I love the rain there just as much as I love the sun. I mean, it's just, I don't know, it's, it's a great country. Um, I learned a lot of recipes from over there. I have certain things that I like to make. Uh, there's something I've been wanting to make forever that is made in Basel, Switzerland called Lacquerly, which is a type of cookie. And I love this cookie and my dad hates it. <laughs> and it's kind of a licorice based uh, uh, cookie that uh, is a little bit chewy. But the thing is, my dad would buy it, and he would open the package, and then the, the item would dry out. And it became super, super hard, where you're trying to bite down on it, and you feel like you're going to break a tooth. And that's because my dad didn't know how to eat it right. <laughs> the rule of, with Lacquerly is you put it inside a container that you can seal, and you put in a slice of an apple in there. And that keeps it nice and moist so that this cookie is actually edible, instead of being something that can, you know, break a tooth, chip a tooth. So, uh, no, I love that stuff, and when I came home in the past, I'd come home with bags of lacquerly. Um, I came home with bottles of kirsch, which is a type of cherry brandy I use for a dessert I make called Linzer Torta. And uh, actually, I haven't had dinner yet tonight, and tonight's dinner is Swiss fondue. So, uh, yeah, I I'm a huge fan of Switzerland. Um... Kevin says, I fully understand about streaming the sumps, but maybe some discussion tutorial on flow designs. I feel like YouTube is lacking any thorough discussions. Uh, they all say it's thorough, but they're wrong. They're terrible. Yeah, um, well, okay, so part of that is going to be there's a lot of opinions out there. Um, I've done a few, and I'm not trying to say no. I mean, yes, I'll do it. But I'm just saying I've covered some videos where I've gone into a lot of why I make the sumps I do. The sump that's under my tank right now, um, I built it last summer. It replaced the one that was under there that was nine years old. And I explained how the old one worked, and I explained how the new one works better, and why I like it so much more. And I actually love it. It's awesome. And it's almost exactly what I want. There's like one more thing I need to do to it, and I just haven't done that project. But other than that, it's a great sump. I'm very happy with it. I'm trying to keep it clean. And I'm very picky about how the flow goes through it. So like you said, um, the thorough discussion of flow you know, almost to like a scientific level, doesn't usually happen. And there are people out there that are just very adamant about it needs to be this way or it needs to be this way. And, you know, I have opinions too. I, I feel like it should be a certain way. And I've been actually, I educate people on this uh, through my website. Um, if there's an article on my website that's called What is a Sump? And I explain from top to bottom. It's a monster article that's had, you know, thousands of reads. And it's a very good article that goes into all the different zones and the flow rates, and how the water should drain in, and you know, and the information is really old. <laughs> I wrote that article a long time ago, but not much has changed. I mean, the only thing that should be added to that article would be uh, talking about the Herbie drain system, and maybe adding a little bit of information about how I'm bringing my water in the side of the sump instead of in the top of the sump, uh, which is something I chose to do with this new sump, and I really like it. <laughs> my sump is dead silent. I can. I only now hear some trickling water because of water coming out of the new turf scrubber I installed a few weeks, uh, two weeks ago, less than two weeks ago. And so I hear that trickling. And I had it really quiet. So now it's like, hmm. And who knows, this summer there may be a video about doing woodwork around my tank. It seems a little late to put it on there after six and a half years. But at the same time, I could trap the sound in there and you guys would have something to see that I haven't done yet. So maybe I'll do that. But uh, yes, going into... Some technology could be a good discussion. And uh, obviously I'm going to, it may seem kind of self-serving and it isn't intended that way because I sell sumps, you know, so they're going to say, oh, he says that because he sells it or something. But no, I, I actually, I have this weird, uh, like sixth sense about how sumps work. It's not because I went to college. It's not because I learned in school. It's not because my dad taught me. It's more like I just know it within me, like within my cells and I just can feel how something is going to be or not. And so over the years, I've chosen to do certain things. And people really like when they get their sump. Like, oh, yeah, this is great. It's worked out really well. I'm very pleased with how it worked out. You know, and, you know, I'm sure a few have said I had my doubts. and But, you know, hopefully they, the doubts faded. And they're like, yeah, no, it's working out like I hoped. I, I'm not saying they're perfect. <laughs> you know, it, it, th there's always another way of doing things. This hobby is full of ideas and, and approaches, but I like to have a sump that's easy to work in, that's easy to clean, 
Um, and uh, so I don't have a lot of weird like bells and whistles on the psalms. I'm more about form and function rather than uh, to leave you this incredible impression. I've seen some ridiculously amazing looking psalms. I mean, they're awesome. They're super expensive. They use all these different colors. They have all these fittings. They have these cable management connectors. They have reactors that are built to fit that psalm. They have lids that go around everything, hug it all in. It looks great brand new. But all I'm thinking in my head is I would hate working in that sump. <laughs> and uh, there was a guy that got one of those amazing sumps and he put it on YouTube. And then like, I guess a year later or two years later, something like that, he did a follow up video. And he says, so now let me tell you guys how I feel about the sump. Now I've had it for a long time. And he says, I cannot clean this spot at all. Absolutely impossible to clean. I hate that. That was the biggest complaint he had. And then, you know, other things were like, you know, I'm stuck with this type of reactor. I had to use this pump. I had no choice because it's all that fits there. And uh, when I have to do this, I have to remove these four things to get to that one item. And that's kind of what I predicted, you know, that when you find yourself in that scenario with something that's so, let's call it high tech, that you'll also have to deal with the struggles of working with this item. It's, it's just like, you know, new cars. New cars have computers that control everything. And mechanics used to lament how in the old days, we just had to worry about a carburetor and a fuel line and it was simple. Now we've got all these computers and all these codes we have to go through to figure out what's going on. And when the computer fails, it costs a fortune where in the old days we could just clean some plugs and replace them. You know, it's just technology. Everything moves forward. So it becomes a little bit more uh, complex to work in. And so that's why I, I like to lean more into simple or clean rather than uh, complicated. And, you know, when people say, oh, I want a lid for over my sump, I'm like, why? Because everything you're going to put in there sticks up. <laughs> and everything's got tubes coming off of it and wires coming off of it. And there's so many things going in and out. There's really, it's really hard to plan out a lid that will fit around everything perfectly and, uh, and still be workable. Matter of fact, there was a company, this was brief, they're gone now. They made a sump that had a lid that fit over the spot where the water would pour in. I was like, oh, that's cool. That's actually pretty smart because you won't have the salt creep. And the, the sump they built was rimless. So what that means is that the, the sump was quarter inch all the way around and there, as salt spatter would happen, it would just hit the cabinet. But what they did is they had the water drain into a filter sock holder. And I thought, okay, well, the sock will catch a lot of bubbles. And then you put that lid on top. But then I was looking at it, I was like, well, how do you install the lid? Because the sock holder that was in the back of the sump, number one, it didn't fit any sock I owned. <laughs> so it was a proprietary sock that I've never even seen. I have never saw a sock that fit that thing. I don't know who made it, if they ever made it, if they made it wrong. I don't know what happened, but no socks I could get my hands on would fit that holder. Above the sock holder was a, like a C-clip with like a screw. And the idea is you could take flexible tubing and push it down through that thing and tighten a screw to hold it. Well... If you have to do that, now you have a tube in the way that's held in place by a screw into the sock. You can't put the lid there now. What you had to do is put the hose through the lid, lift the lid up, tighten the screw, lower the lid. I'm like, okay, that's a little complicated, but it's not the end of the world, except you have to change the sock frequently, which kind of sucks. But okay, whatever. But then the next thing that I thought was a terrible design, same spot under the same lid, they intentionally mounted... A, a tube holder for your dosing and it had four little uh, holes with four screws to screw on the tubing. The lid had four round holes in it. <laughs> See where I'm going? You had a lid and you had to put the tube in to go to the sock and you had to put the four tubes through the lid and then basically you had to like lift the lid up through all the tubings and the big tube to tighten all these screws down and then put the lid back down. And I thought, oh my God, who is gonna to wanna to do this? No one. They should have made a cutout that went around the four tubes so you could kind of like fold it into place. And you know, the part with the sock in the back, not great, but you know. Anyway, that company doesn't exist. I mean, <laughs> it didn't work out. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, that thing looked awesome on computer, but as a real hobbyist trying to work in it, it's a nightmare. And then the next problem was then, then the water flowed over into the next zone, which was your protein skimmer. And the only way, and this, and it came with the skimmer. And the only way to get to the sock was to get the skimmer out of your way. 
And I was like, well, I guess you could try to remove the collection cup to get to that sock. But then I was like, but then you've got the lid down. You've got the tubing bolted in. You've got to remove the tubing, remove the lid, loosen the screw to get the sock out, to get the new sock in, and the sock doesn't even fit the whole... But anyway, uh, it just wasn't a good design. <laughs> so the simpler, the better. Uh, just because I feel like if something's overly complicated, you won't work on it. That was the very long answer to your question. Um, Mayor Reef says, I'm dosing equal parts of two parts. My alkalinity is 8.6, my calcium is 440. Recent alkalinity got, has gone up to 10.2, and calcium is down to 370. No water changes uh, and uh, have been done, and magnesium is at 1359. How do I fix it, and what do you think caused it? Okay, so in the old days, you would dose two part, and you were told dose equal amounts every single day. And we would test our water once a week, and we just didn't know better. <laughs> but we have learned that different additives are taken up by our reef and by our fish and by the coralline algae at different rates. And so as the numbers shift, you have to adjust. So at this point, you need to dose a little bit more calcium you need to dose a little less alkalinity, and you need to increase your magnesium dose if you're even dosing that at all. And if you bring, I mean, your magnesium's not off much. 1380, uh, 1280 is natural seawater. I like 1400. You're at 1359. You're so close. You're 1360. You're 40 ppm away from my goal. So a little bit more magnesium would be helpful. Also double check your salinity. That's very important. If your salinity is dropping, that will affect all these test results. So we want our salinity to be around 1.026. And then, like I said, I wouldn't dose alkalinity for a couple of days. I would probably increase your calcium dose slightly and then, you know, retest frequently, you know, test each day or every other day and kind of see where things are until you find your sweet spot again. But you may discover your tank needs, I'm just going to pull random numbers out of the air. This has nothing to do with your numbers. Uh, you might discover your tank needs 10 ml of alkalinity and needs 18 ml of calcium to be the perfect numbers. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not cheating. You're not doing something wrong. Your tank needs that. Every tank is different. Uh, Eric says, have you noticed any new growth on the algae scrubber? <laughs> Are the nitrates going down? Are the nitrates going down? Cheers. That's funny. <laughs> okay. So the scrubber's been running nine, ten days. I don't know. There are hints of algae on it. I saw, I was actually going to pull it out today and look, I haven't done it yet. But uh, there's a little bit happening at the top and there's a little tiny bit at the bottom and the rest of the whole sheet has nothing on it. So no, it's not going to affect nitrates at this point. It's going to take a while. It's probably going to take a couple of months to do anything impressive. But uh, once it starts going, it's going to make a big difference. The, uh, the reason it's taking a little bit longer than what most people would have is because you're supposed to seed the screen with algae from someone else's scrubber and just kind of rub it all over the sheet to kind of give it some, you know, some seeds, something to grow. And because I didn't do that, because we all went into lockdown, my uh, scrubber is basically a virgin scrubber that is pulling crap out of the water just through osmosis. You know, just the reef water is pumping through it, and it's slowly doing something with the lights cooking on it 12 hours a day. Uh, I did talk with Jason. He suggested if I could tolerate it uh, to run it for 18 hours a day, but I'm not. I'm just running 12 hours a day. And it's running from 12.30 at night to 12.30 noon. And then it's off throughout the day because the cooling fans and the lights, I don't like hearing them. Uh, I'm being really picky about sound, which is the other reason why I'm thinking I might have to do the woodwork so I can, you know, kind of let things be a little noisier in that room. I just like it quiet in here. So uh, anyway, he says nitrates are going to come down. Uh, the question is going to be, will nitrates come down? And the other question is going to be, will my refugium die back? Will the plants just die off? I've got a whole bunch of calerpa in there that's uh, looking lush and green right now. Uh, I've got some hints of cyanobacteria happening in there. I've been basically cleaning it out manually rather than treating the entire tank because there's none in the tank. It's only in the refugium. But uh, uh, idea, the, uh, the theory is, or the, uh, the premise is, premise, is that the turf scrubber will do such a good job that my refugium will suffer and starve back and I'm going to see my macroalgae just die off. That's what I'm being told. So I'm going to watch and see if that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, 
Uh, George says, I'm thinking of converting my 5 foot by 2 foot by 2 foot freshwater tank into a mixed reef. Can I get away with using three AI Hydra 32s, or do I have to get um, two of the Hydra 62s? Um, a mixed reef is usually softies and LPS corals. Um, you might have some desires for SPS corals too, it's possible. But you can put them up higher in the tank. You may be able to just use the lights you own and just see how it works out. Uh, you have the ability to turn them up and down because you have the ability to increase intensity and even pick the spectrum. So you could run them at a higher percentage and see how that does. You may discover that the light setting that you've been using um, with your tank right now is sufficient. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what settings you're using, but we I do know you have the ability to change it. And if things really don't work out with the lights you already own, then yes, possibly buying something new um, that's more intense would be the way to go. But I really can't say, oh, you know, don't use that, buy something new. That's kind of unfair to you because you already bought gear. So try using the gear you own. Try turning up the uh, intensity. You still want the lights to be about 10 inches off the water, I'd say, 9, 10 inches off the water. And uh, you also want to have your, your lighting period a fixed amount of hours per day. I really like to aim for 7 or 8 hours a day, not 12 and 14 hours a day. I just bring it down and have it more intense for that nine hour period. And you can have like a ramp up and ramp down for an hour at each end to kind of give you a, a nice uh, sunrise and dusk type environment. But uh, that would be my advice for now. Just try that out and see what it does. And then if you're like, I'm not happy, I want to add another light or I want to replace them with better ones, you still can. But I would try and use what you have right now. Uh, just another reef tank says, are you dosing magnesium as well? I actually am. I uh, didn't dose it for a long time because my trident said I had plenty. It said I was, you know, just over 1,400. And I didn't dose it for eight months, and I lost MP uh, a lot of Montipora. <laughs> it just was fading away. I was like, it's so weird. I got plenty of, mon of magnesium. I wonder what's going on. And so I went ahead, and uh, I just didn't use any. And then finally, I was like, I've had enough. I'm going to dose magnesium. I don't care what the trident says. And I did, and what was left of the monopore came back. <laughs> it came back to life. It started growing, and it started getting color. I was like, hey! And I even had an acropora that was just like bone white, but not dead. And now it's kind of a beautiful teal color. So it's uh, it's pretty nice. So, uh, yes, I do dose. I use Magnesium Pronto. It's a really cool product from Two Little Fishies. I really like it a lot. It's on my shop. One jar is about 20 bucks, and it makes almost 5 gallons of solution so it's a really good deal and it's really easy I, I have it hooked up to a dosing pump and it trickles in I don't know 80 90 milliliters a day I have a uh, the dose is right above the intake of my power head of my uh, return pump so as it trickles in it just right into the reef um, hey we've been going for over an hour that was not my intention uh, Tim says did you look at the miracle mud idea for the white tail tang I did not um, I haven't considered it yet. Uh, we'll see what happens with this turf scrubber, first of all. It could be that my high nitrates are affecting that coal tank. Um, but if the refugium dies back, then that would be a perfect place to put the Miracle Mud tray. Um, I'm, I've never been impressed by any tanks I saw with Miracle Mud, so that's why I'm not so inclined to go that direction. But, you know, it, it's, I've seen it for a long time. So, maybe. We'll see. Uh, I guess Radiant is the way you say your name. Uh, how will a host anemone and clownfish pair handle a tank move? Will the clowns still host? Actually, what you want to do is the, the anemone is the host, and the clownfish lives in its host. Uh, if you can, I love doing this when it comes to moving a tank. I like to move the anemone with its clownfish in a bowl. Keep them together. And so what I would do is I would lift the rock out of the tank. There's the anemone, and the clownfish is staying with it. It's trying to protect it. It's trying to stay in it. And I put a bowl underneath, and I lift the entire thing up out of the tank and keep them together. And I don't release the clown elsewhere. I, it stays with the anemone in a very small container of some kind that works out just right to where the rock and the anemone is submerged, and the clownfish <laughs> has a couple of inches of water all the way around. And you, know, you might have to put an air stone or something. It depends how far you're moving and all that. But uh, you could even possibly, I mean, I don't know what your scenario is, but I could even see, like, the rock and the anemone 
depending on how big this rock is. You know, it might be a, you know, a rock this big. You could have the anemone on there, the clownfish, and put in a huge bag at the fish store and have them pump in air and tie the bag off, like, you know, taking, taking livestock home. And then when you go to your new location, acclimate and release them together back into the tank again. So that would be my preference rather than separating them and trying to divide and then reacquaint them later. I keep them together. Oh, see, I always say it backwards. Thank you, Keith. <laughs> always do that. That's why I look it up. He says uh, soda ash is carbonate. Baking soda is bicarbonate. Bicarb doesn't raise pH. Soda ash does. Well, I know soda ash brings it up. So soda ash is carbonate. Okay, that makes sense. Because when you buy Arm & Hammer, that is bicarbonate. And when you bake it, it becomes soda ash. So it becomes carbonate. Thank you very much. Um, so everything I said earlier that was wrong, I apologize, guys. I told you, I mix it up. That's why I look it up. <laughs> I really need a script. <laughs> this freestyling is crazy. Uh, let's see. Tim says, I've always wondered about the picture on the wall to your left. It almost looks like Lockheed X-Men type dragons. This I got at Comic-Con. The artist, his name is Mike Bocianoli, Nowly. and I'll turn this off so you guys can see the whole thing. So he does these awesome dragons, super cute. They obviously are avoiding the water. And when I saw this at Comic-Con, he had also drawn on the mat all the way around it. And I was like, that is awesome. And so I bought it, brought it home, framed it, and it hangs next to me at my desk every single day. I'm a huge fan of cartoons. I always have been. I refuse to grow up. <laughs> I'm going to be a kid forever. So um, I have this one here. So it's signed by the artist. And then above it is another cartoon you guys never see. This is very old. This is BC, a comic strip that was always in the newspaper. And uh, on Sundays, this was usually in color. And this is by Johnny Hart. And this, um, it was autographed by his father. I'm sorry, it was autographed by Johnny Hart, which is the father. And um, at one point, our newspaper had stopped running BC. And everyone wrote into the newspaper demanding it be brought back. Because we're very picky. And we want our BC comic strip. And I sent him the column and showed how everyone supported him and how we wanted his strip. And the newspaper brought it back. And because I sent him that, he sent me this as a thank you. And he autographed the top. And he says, with all good wishes, Johnny Hart. So I've had this up here a long time. And then the other one, which will be impossible to hang while I'm on a live camera. I'm going to try my best here. Oh, I got it. What do you know? Cool. So there's all kinds of art surrounding me. Um, different things. And there's a lot of stuff in the back room, too. Let's see. Steve Drake says, dosing two-part, calcium and alkalinity. What are your thoughts on dosing times for each to keep levels as stable as possible? A little for 24 hours or more for a shorter period of time. Uh, okay, so you're asking, can you dose multiple times a day versus doing it all at once? In the old days, I was dosing once a day because I was pouring in with my hand. <laughs> but uh, what you can do uh, these days is use dosing pumps. And the one thing I tell everyone is to always dose your alkaline in the morning when the pH is lowest in your tank because it brings the pH up slightly, kind of keeps it up. So I'm suggesting actually starting to dose maybe around 5 or 6 in the morning and dose whatever the day needs for a few hours. So like, let's say you start at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. and you let it dose through like 11 a.m. or so. And that way the alkaline is up nice and high as the corals are waking up and start growing and they're absorbing alkalinity. And then in the evening, around 6 p.m. or so, dose your calcium. And you can dose that for over a couple of hours or so. And magnesium, I don't think any kind of schedule matters. I just basically have it hit my tank once a day. So uh, it takes a lot of magnesium to bring magnesium up in a tank. And uh, I see no point to spread it out in little doses. I just let it run. <laughs> I just let it rip, like they say on tanked. Let's see. 
Uh, Hamada says, I dosed fluconazole. It's been two days, and it seems like the algae wants to come right off. Can I siphon out algae using a hose and drain it in the sump using a filter sock to trap the algae? You could, but uh, I kind of like the idea more of removing it from the system entirely rather than trying to recycle the water because the water going through the sock will still have some of the algae coming through. I mean, because the sock is not like industrial grade, you know, <laughs> it's going to let some, I, I'm not going to say algae spores, but you know, it's going to be kind of dirty water with nutrients. I'd rather just see you drain, you know, siphon out what bothers you into a bucket and just throw it out. Um, matter of fact, when it comes to algae, it's actually recommended whatever algae that you have, you should put it in a bag and then throw it in the freezer and let it die in the freezer and then throw it away. That way there's no risk of it uh, becoming a, uh, a nuisance elsewhere, like in the in the water tables or something. It, it's something about saving the planet. So that's something specifically with Calerpa, but you know, it could be other algaes as well. Uh, so anyway, the point is you, you definitely, if you, if it starts coming off, yeah, pull it out now. The less you have in the tank, the better. And, uh, but I don't think I would do the recycle through a sock thing because you'll end up putting a lot of the stuff you're trying to remove right back into the system as it flows through the sock. James says, I have leathers in my tank and I can't seem to get them to open up. Any suggestions? Sometimes leathers close up because it's that's normal for them. They are a coral that sheds, and they could be closed down for a week or so, a couple of weeks, and then they open up and they're good for a good long time. And then they seem to close up for a week, and that's part of their shedding and growth process. They grow and they shed. They, they throw off this mucus-looking stuff, and it kind of rejuvenates themselves. But there is a chance that either the chemicals you're putting in your tank, whatever that may be, could be irritating this coral. It could be there's a fish nipping at the coral and actually biting the polyps and so the coral won't open up. Or it could be that you have something aluminum-based in your tank because aluminum and leathers do not mix. So if you are using something that has aluminum in it, like maybe those bricks that we put in our sumps to uh, reduce nitrate, or there's a product called Kent Phosphate Sponge, which is like white gravel. Apparently, it's all aluminum-based. And when I put that in my system, my leather shut down and would not open until I removed it. So maybe you have something like that going on. JNY says, I made it. You did. You did make it. Uh, Nozilla says, have you ever had a fish just vanish from your tank overnight with no body? I had a Lamarck's angel that just vanished overnight and no body in the tank or on the floor. Yeah, it's happened to me too. I had a lionfish vanish. <laughs> and I was sure I'd find some part of it, and it did not exist. The entire cleanup crew just took care of it, and that was the end of it. How often do you, uh, Austin says, how often do you target feed or just throw food in the tank? What's the best way to grow zoas and blastos and acans without constantly feeding them? Well, quit buying corals that need to be fed if you don't like feeding them. I mean, it's sort of like saying, I have to keep putting food in the bowl for the dog. You know, it's like, don't have a dog then. But uh, broadcast feeding is nice. It's easier. Uh, I tend to just throw food in the tank. Uh, but I try to once a week, I'm trying to do it twice a week. I try once a week to put in Benna Reef to feed everything in the reef um, that I'm not target feeding with my hand. <laughs> so uh, you could do the same. Target feeding is a nice way of doing it. Um, people enjoy it. They actually like stopping all the flow in the tank and mixing up a bowl of something that's really, let's call it thick, and they use a turkey baster to bring this in, and then they squirt this broth over the coral, and the coral opens up and has all these tentacles come out, and or they like seeing it close down on it. It's really exciting. So you know, maybe take a new approach. You know, Observe what's happening rather than think of it as, as effort. Or like I said, quit getting corals that require effort. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you'll you'll never be happy, and they won't do well. So that'd be my advice. Call me Nemo. What a good name. Says greetings from Japan. Is this going to be a marathon live stream? No. Uh, actually, I need to stop this thing like in the next couple of minutes because I got to feed my tank before all the lights turn off. The anemone cube is completely dark. I need to turn that on. I did this last night because I was the clock got ahead of me, and. Uh, the clownfish didn't want to come out and get their food. They were being skittish. I was like, what are you doing? There's food in the water, and they weren't interested. All right, so I put on some light there, and uh, I'm going to have to melt some food. Or actually, let me let me do this. Um, 
Let me abandon you and I'll do some flake food because that's super fast. I'll be back. All right, I did that for y'all. So uh, they have flake food and pellet food. That is not the normal meal. The copper band is like, where is the good stuff? But that is the end of that. Let's see. <laughs> Anchor says, you can start now. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, DDOT says, I run a small all-in-one tank. I'm running with no skimmer. Do I need to add an air bubbler? I don't think you need to. I mean, you could, but it's not a necessity. Most of us don't want air stones inside our display tanks. Uh, perhaps what you could do is make sure you have some kind of a small power head inside the display section that is making the surface ripple, you know, like seriously ripple, and that will promote oxygen exchange, you know, gas exchange at the surface. Uh, if the water of your top of your all-in-one tank is like kind of stagnant and got like stuff floating on the surface or it's a little oily looking, that's bad. Um, then yes, a bubbler could work, but then you're gonna be looking at bubbles blowing around in your tank, and most of us don't want to see that in a reef tank. Mario, we did this to throw you off. <laughs> we uh, a midweek stream was a surprise. Oh, uh, good. Look, we got somebody who wants to create a debate. Um, do coral need white light or just blue? Is it enough? What gives better color? Uh, love your streams. Um, <clears throat> I highly recommend white light. And a lot of people are like, you don't need white light, which is insane. So I'm just going to say that I disagree with those that say you don't need white light. I feel like, yes, blue is pretty. Yes, it makes things really colorful. It's actually tricking you. You know, because when you do see the coral with white light, you see it's not, you can't actually see the health of the coral in blue light. And when you hit it with white light, you're like, oh, that doesn't look nearly as good as I thought it would look. So think about where the corals come from. In real life, they come from oceans that are under the sun and they get sunlight. And I have been in conversations with people. There was a guy that basically said he couldn't even have this conversation with me if I didn't understand that the water in the ocean is blue. <laughs> the water in the ocean is not blue. The water is water, just like in a glass. It's water, and it will look different colors based on the color of the sky above. Have you ever seen beautiful blue azure, azure water under a blue sky, but then if it's a cloudy, rainy day, it looks kind of gray and ugly or even kind of brown? That There are some colors, yes. There are some parts of the ocean that are like these ridiculous colors, it's almost a reflection off the sand beneath, and you know, there's, a, there's a lot of factors to keep in mind. But the water itself, you can't go down and grab a sample of water and bring it up. It's going to be blue. That's just not going to happen. 
There is a breakdown of the way the light shines down through the water. And yes, the white penetrates X far, red goes this far, blue goes this far. Yes, I understand all of that. I actually try to keep this very simple. I recommend some white light in your tank every single day. You know, if you can manage it a couple of hours a day with white light and then switch over to the blues for the rest of the day is what I recommend. And that way you get the growth that the corals need from white light and then you get the coloration from the blue and you get to enjoy the view for the later part of the day. So that's my recommendation to you. And you can do a lot of research on this and you can read all the debates and uh, see what you can live with. But uh, my tank gets white light for an hour and a half on each bulb uh, every single day. And the anemone cube goes through a, a white cycle and then into the blue. And the frag tank kind of just gets whatever it gets because I ignore that one. So I do recommend white light. And to not have any is a disservice to the corals. I've, basically what happens is with white light, with 6,500 Kelvin to 10,000 Kelvin, you get growth. Uh, some of the best growth we ever got was with the hideous 6,500. Or, uh, man, I feel like we might have even dipped down to 5,000 Kelvin. And things grew so fast and grew huge. And it was awesome, but it was brown. <laughs> it was so ugly. And then after you grew the giant thing, then you threw it under total blue light for eight weeks. And then you could sell it because now it was pretty. And uh, that's how they did it. But uh, nowadays, you'll see some tanks that look fantastic with a lot of blue light. And there are some people out there that say that's all they run is blue all the time. Um, I don't know the truth. I don't know that they're really running blue all the time. I don't know how long they've had a certain coral, how big that coral is, how big that coral was when they got it, you know, that kind of thing. Because that's the whole point. You put in a frag, and then you want to turn into a colony, and it's going to take years to become a colony. It will grow quicker under white light than it will under blue. Now, there are people out there that love to frag corals and sell. I mean, that's their big thing, and they just... They're moving corals all the time. And so for them, having just pure blue light makes them sell really quick, and they get them out, and they have room for new ones to come in, and that's all well and good. But, you know, I mean, there's a guy here in Arlington, which is not far from me, and he came to visit me. And, I mean, the guy is a huge coral seller. He loves selling corals. And he was looking at my tank and says, I've never seen an acropora that big in my life. And I'm looking at him like, that's not big. <laughs> I've seen big. That's, that, that's nice. I mean, it's great, but I've seen people much bigger colonies than I've had. And uh, he was like, that's incredible. And I was thinking, quit fragging your corals. Let them grow. So, uh, you know, and, you know, like I said, I use white light. That's a very long answer to your question. <laughs> Anchor says, do you think filter roller fleece could be used as TP in an emergency? Uh, it might be hard to tear. You might have to do scissors and I'll tell you this you'll probably have problems with the sewer and, and you know you got to pay for a plumber so maybe don't use fleece for hiney cleaning uh halco hal halk of drops I'm not sure how you pronounce that how cough drops maybe that's what it is it says do you ever experience some ac uh, acros that won't grow while others will in your tank, even frags from the same purchase? Yeah, I've got a couple that have sat there and done nothing. They're being super stagnant, and I've got others that grow every single day. So uh, it happens. I basically like to pick the ones that make me happy, the ones that do well, and not dwell in the ones that aren't moving. <laughs> if they just sit there stagnant, it's like, okay, whatever. And if they choose to grow at some point, yay. And if they choose not to, oh well. And if I end up losing them, it's not a big loss because it never did anything in the first place. Uh, Luis, thank you very much for the super chat. What's in your cup, he says. Uh, this is some Crown Royal. And uh, it's just the regular Crown Royal, not the good one. And he says, Johnny Black for me. Support small businesses. I know firsthand how hard it is right now. Too small to fail. Oh, he did hashtag too small to fail. Support your local restaurant. You know, um, it's scary what's going on out there right now with businesses. And uh, I've, my, my uh, best friend in, Flor in uh, Florida, in Hawaii, is really struggling right now with what's going to happen with her dive shop. And, you know, restaurant industry, it's just as bad right now. I mean, a lot of them are trying to change over to delivery or uh, drive through And, you know, there's we'll just have to see how this all plays out. But yeah, I agree with you, man. Thank you very much for the super chat. That was nice of you. Uh, 
Um, Chawa Bob says, my calcium keeps climbing in my tank. The alkaline is 7.36, the calcium is 863, and the magnesium is 1236, or 1263. I do not dose. I change my salt to lower the new calcium coming into the tank. I was doing 30% water changes a few times a day. Any ideas? Yeah, where are these numbers coming from? Who's testing that water? What are you using to test with? Are you trusting the Trident? Are you using handheld test kits, titration kits? Are they Red Sea, Salifer, Elos, Nios? What are you using? Has anyone else tested your water with their kits? Have you gone to the fish store and had them test your water with their kits? Just to do a comparison, have you shipped off some water to ICP to have them give you some results to compare against? Because your calcium is crazy high. And uh, really, if it was that number... Even though your alkaline is kind of low, I would expect some kind of precipitation. Also, how are you... Okay, you said you do not dose. So I was going to say, how are you dosing? But you're not dosing. So I don't know that I believe the numbers. Something's not right. Uh, calcium could be coming from the rock, though. Like if you have man-made rock or you made your own rock because you're trying to save money, a lot of calcium can come off of that concrete mix, and it, could, it takes a while for that to kind of burn off. Uh, maybe that's where you're getting this calcium from, if it's a real number. But I would try and double-check all the numbers. Also, I'd raise your alkaline a little bit low, but higher in the meantime, as well as your magnesium. Those are both a little too low. But uh, um, Also, you want to test your salt. You, know, you said you're doing the water changes. I would test the water you're mixing and see what the numbers are coming out of that. And you didn't mention how much livestock you have or if you have any livestock at all or if it's just you know kind of a, a new tank. If there's very little livestock in there, you might just do a massive water change with good salt water that has the right numbers to kind of reboot the tank. But if there's a lot of livestock in there and you're worried about stressing it, then you know your 30% water changes could work, but you're going to need to make sure that your temperature, your salinity, and your pH are the exact same as the tank. And if it's exact same, you can change a whole bunch of water. You could literally do like a what do you call it? Like a transfusion, you know, or what do you, what do they do on, you know, like dialysis where they just run it through a machine. You could literally be running water through the tank over and over and over until you've replaced every drop of it. But uh, you need your water that's going in to be better than the water that's in the tank already to get those numbers on track. Kenny, are you talking to me? I need to go find that messenger. I don't know if I saw it or not. I want to double check. <laughs> Myers Reef says, since you're streaming, that means tank test Tuesday. Water test Tuesday. No, that's not a thing. It's still water test Saturday. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, sorry, uh, there was no point showing you guys me feeding the tank because I just threw a bunch of flake food in there. I just flung it at the fish and hope they'll find enough to eat tonight. I'll have to spoil them tomorrow during the daytime uh, to make up for this horrible treatment that I gave them tonight. They they really do rely on their frozen food every night. They were even looking at it like, what is this stuff? Let's see. Um, <laughs> this chair is done. I need to replace it. I just realized you guys saw it when I got up and walked away. It's The leather's just peeling off. It's it, this pleather, whatever it is. It's garbage. And I need to replace it. It's so bad. It's been well used. But it's, uh, it's done. Wow. Reef Therapy says, it's been a strange day. I found a fish and a snail in my sump. I'm not sure how either of them got down there. Probably the drain. That's usually how it works. Um, though it is crazy, you could have gotten super lucky if a fish jumped and kind of ricocheted and bounced into the sump. That could happen, but it's kind of rare. Uh, Rogue Aquariums. Darren, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Uh, he says, any, uh, Stephen says, any magazines being given away this stream? No, I think we wiped them out. Um... The one thing I did since Saturday, I talked to Coral Magazine, and I said to him, you know, I think I want to sell some of your magazines from the shop. 
So what I'm doing is I'm going to go ahead and bring in, I don't know, like six issues you know, of the latest issue, get six copies, and put that in the shop and see if anyone wants to buy it. And uh, basically do that every, because an issue comes out every two months. So I, I feel like I can afford six magazines at a time. <laughs> and we'll see if anyone wants to put that in their order along with other things they're buying. Um, it may become a problem because, like, for example, let's say somebody wants the Nero 5 Guard, which is a little tiny circle, and then they want the magazine. You know, it's a totally different shape, you know, but I don't know. We'll figure it out. But uh, I decided to do that, which will allow some of you that were wanting one issue to, like, try out the magazine and see if you like it. And uh, that way you have an option to buy one, you know, buy a copy. It's sort of like, you know, you're at the store and you're standing there bored and you're like, hey, I'll buy this magazine. You know, it's hopefully it'll be something you guys feel. It's, I feel like it's really good knowledge. And so I do re uh, recommend that issue to everyone and I recommend people get subscriptions to it, obviously. But uh, yeah, we've given away a lot of copies over the last uh, few streams. But I think uh, after the list Andrea sent me today, I think we used them all up. Uh, D dot, if you've got the random flow generators inside your tank and you've got good rippling surface, you don't need a bubbler in the back. Absolutely not. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Reefbuster says on the topic of white versus blue light, what do you think of the AB spectrum ratio? All I know is everyone loves it. <laughs> I don't know why. I love the radiant schedule. Um, I've been running the radiant schedule for, with my radions for a very long time. And uh, I can show you what that looks like. You go into EcoSmart Live. Of course, it doesn't know my password. Hang on a second. And we're going to go to the anemone cube, and we're going to look at the radion. Oh, there it is. Perfect. So I'm going to have to make this thing kind of weird, and hopefully it'll fit the screen properly for you guys. Okay. I think this will work. So here is my schedule. Let me... i got to move a couple things around here. Turn this off. So uh, this is my schedule right here, and each of these points is where the spectrum and the intensity changes. So you can see my total intensity for the light of the tank is 81%. And then each of the, I have to change this window just slightly for a second here so that it'll um, show you more information. Now when I tap one of these things, you'll see my different colors that are being used here on the left side of the screen. Sure, you see that, yeah. And um, as we go throughout the day, you'll see that changing on the left. Uh, I have to keep scrolling down, but uh, you'll see more of the colors are coming in. So now my whites are coming in, and my yellows. And this has been my programming for this tank for years. And so at the peak of the day. I've got my uh, intensity, my overall intensity for the radiant schedule is at 63%. I could actually go even higher, but I, I kind of like the schedule. And now that I've added the Refrite XHOs, there's really no reason to uh, push more light in there. I think my tank is actually changing colors as I'm clicking these points right now. It's kind of funny. I'm catching my eye. But the uh, graph on the left here is changing as I go through each, each of these points. But it's basically some kind of a bell curve is that the tank goes through. And uh, that's my schedule every day. So it starts at basically 1 p.m. And then by you know 10.45, it's done. And then it just tapers off into darkness as we get toward midnight. Uh, so they have this schedule here, which is about whatever that is, 10 hours of light maybe at the most. So uh, I've been doing the schedule for a long time. This is basically what they offer. If you go up here to schedule options and you load from a template, they show you these choices. And here's the core lab everyone likes to do. And you can see it goes up, up straight down down very boring i like the radiant schedule i just adjusted mine slightly to what i liked here's a more traditional level which is not much different from the coral lab and then they have freshwater planted shallow reef and deep water reef which you'd think i'd go this route but i really like the radiant color i've always liked it 
And so I've been running it that way for a long time. And uh, then when you're done loading whichever one you like and you make your adjustments, you hit save. So that's that. Uh, I just wanted to show you that. All right. Marine Life says, what is your method for getting rid of cyanobacteria? Uh, Kemi, clean, or red cyano RX. And all you have to do is turn off your protein skimmer, remove any carbon, put in the product in the tank. Uh, make sure your tank has plenty of oxygen in it. If it doesn't, use an air pump and add an air stone right in the display tank in front of a big power head that just blows bubbles through the tank. It's because you do not want the oxygen levels to plummet in the tank because of the medication, because your fish will suffer. And then after three days, if the cyano is completely gone, and I mean gone, <laughs> not fading away and coming back, but like you don't see any trace of it, then do a huge water change and uh, fire up the protein skimmer, start running carbon, and uh, get things back on track. If you still see cyano after three days, I actually put more medicine in the tank and do it again for two more days. And I'll watch it every day and make sure it looks fine. And when it's, you know, so now we're at five days of this medication in the tank and I can turn the protein skimmer on, do the big water change, get the skimmer to skim, uh, run the fresh carbon, and then it's done. And if I have to do that once or twice a year, which I have in the past, I haven't treated for cyano in forever. I mean, years. I don't remember the last time I treated for cyano, but I used to do it about once or twice a year. And I never thought it was a big deal. I just did it, solved the problem, and moved on with my life. And I didn't have to look at red crap all over my tank. So that's my method. And it's on my website. Um, D-Dot says, uh, my 90 gallon has been running for almost two years. I do a 10% water change every week. Last week I noticed all of my A-cans, about 15 different ones, are all closed and won't open, but the parameters are good. Well, something's not good if they're closed. So you're going to have to find out what's happened. Is something in the tank? Is something on your hand when you put your hand in the tank? Uh, is some fish picking at these corals? It, I mean, something's not right. And you have to figure out what it is. It could be the most random thing. It could be... The magnets that hold the frag rack in your tank are cracked open. It could be uh, a magnet inside the protein skimmer is cracked open. I, I, a lot of times magnets do this. Stray electricity in the tank, like the heater's leaking power into the water, or a power head is now failing. These are things that can cause problems inside the tank and make corals close up. But a lot of times it's something more specific and more immediate, like you dosed a vitamin C to the tank or your alkalinity has spiked and made your pH go much too high, and so the, the A-can's all closed up, and they're miserable. I mean, it could be something like that. It could be a fish nipping at them nonstop. I mean, there's, there's a few things. It's not just, like, one thing that will solve it. But you're going to have to kind of really go through a process of elimination, spend a lot of time looking at the tank, looking at everything, trying to figure out if anything is near the tank or getting into the tank, if there's something weird in the sump that doesn't belong because a kid threw it in. I mean, you know, there's just... Could be a lot of different things. Yeah, I okay, so you're using the Elos test kits and you're using the Trident. So you're believing the Trident. Stop believing the Trident. Focus on the Elos test kits for sure. Test your tank water. Test your new salt water. Compare the numbers and see what's going on. Uh, it is possible that you're getting a really high calcium reading on the Trident. Um, that happens especially to people that have some kind of air getting into the line as the bottle gets low on reagent. That's been kind of an ongoing uh, complaint by some people. It doesn't happen very often, but it happens to some people. And it could be, I mean, I feel like that number is just, it's so high, it's almost not believable. Uh, Drama D says, I have a 40 gallon softy LPS tank. It is a little over a year old, and the parameters are stable, and there's very minimal swings. But any SPS I put in there slowly STNs, which means slow tissue necrosis. Um, easy to hard SPS, all STN, any ideas? It could be 
when you dip these new corals, that the dip is so harsh, it's killing the coral already. And, you know, you plant it in your tank and it just fades away over the next week or so. It depends how quickly it's happening. It could be that the new frag is planted too high up in the tank and is getting too much light for too long per day and should have been down on the sand bed for a while. Any new frag I get, I like to dip it. Take a turkey baster and blaster from all sides. Make sure it looks clean. Then I put it down. I jam the plug into the sand bed. And I leave it there for a couple of weeks to keep my hands off of it. And then after a couple of weeks, then I can move it to its new location. And hopefully it'll do well. And uh, But you said any SPS you use. So I'm wondering if you're doing the exact same thing with every SPS. Or if you've tried all over the tank and no matter where you put it. Um, also, there are certain corals that are soft corals, like the Sinularia, that Sinularia and Acropora don't live together in the same water. And uh, if you have that soft coral, for example, that could be killing every SPS you put in there. So maybe that's the culprit. Um, so I'm saying it could be dip, it could be lighting, it could be water parameters different from where you're getting the you know the coral came from, or it could be a leather interaction basically becoming a uh, chemical warfare through allopathy. Allelopathy. I think I say that wrong all the time. <laughs> Diacanthus Reef says, I had a bolt break through the computer seat the other day. That was an unpleasant surprise. No doubt. Anchor says, I should drop the crown and get the Irish. That would require me to leave these doors. I'm not leaving. I'm really trying to stay indoors as much as possible. I've stuck my head outside a few times. I've received some deliveries. I've had a couple of customers stop by to pick up things, and I have it in a bag, and I just hand it out the door. Um, I am being super cautious. Not absolute paranoid cautious, but because I'm going to FedEx. I'm going to the post office. You know, I did get groceries. I mean, any one of those spots could have got me already at this point. But uh, I'm hoping I have not been exposed. We'll see. We will see. Um, hey, Jay's watching the stream from the TV. That's good because every time you're on here, you say your phone is dying. I don't know why your phone never has a charge. Uh, Terry Fish says, I'm from Australia. Good afternoon. Quick question. Why do you suggest alkalinity above 8, which is higher than natural seawater? Is there a reason? Uh, the target range for alkalinity in most reef tanks, you know, for us hobbyists, we aim between 8 and 11. The people that run it at 7 are usually doing that because their nutrients are so crazy low. You know, they have low nitrate and low phosphate, or they have zero nitrate and zero phosphate, so they're maintaining a lower alkalinity. Um, me, I'm all about phosphate and nitrate. I'm the king of it. I have tons of it. And I can actually have my tank at 22 dKH, and the reef doesn't even care. <laughs> And it's happened twice. <laughs> um, obviously, that's not a good thing to do, but it's happened twice. But I like to keep my tank at 9. Um, when you say we're comparing to natural seawater, we also have to say comparing it to which natural seawater. Are we comparing it to Fiji? Are we comparing it to the Great Barrier Reef? Are we comparing it to Indonesia? You know, are we comparing it to Hawaii? Bonaire? You know, uh, South Florida in the Florida Keys? There's water everywhere. So it's actually kind of nice to know where corals are coming from and try to match those. And actually, one of the things I've done in some recent dive trips is I come home with a water sample and send it to ICP to get numbers. But 8 to 11 is a really good target range somewhere. You pick a number anywhere between 8 and 11. 8.5, always be 8.5. If you're like 10.5, always be 10.5. Just pick a number and stay there. Um, the running it at 7 is... Uh, I know some people do it. I don't understand why they do it. It seems a little too low to me um, because there's so little cushion if the alkalinity drops. If you're keeping it seven and it kind of drops out for some reason, like a dosing pump stops dosing or the container runs dry and you don't notice it, you're down in 5.56 really fast. There's there's no like a window. It, it's just it's right on the edge of oh my god. <laughs> so eight to eleven somewhere in there. That's why I like nine. I've I've like nine for a very long time. I've been keeping around nine for as much as, for as long as I can remember, and uh, it's just my target number. But in the past, I I kept around eleven for a long time. My two hundred eighty gallon reef it was at eleven. It makes the acros grow faster. 
Let's see. Okay, six more minutes. I'm just going to keep it scrolling and wrap this thing up. We're going to stop at two hours. I did not even want to do two hours. I wanted to do like 23 minutes. Uh, Marine Life says, do you think a fire shrimp and a cleaner shrimp could live together in a 24-gallon tank? I do. I don't know if it'll last forever, but I do think that it could work. And uh, they are both beautiful shrimp, and uh, they might be okay together. They're not natural aggressors, if that's what you're asking. Um, Josh says, would bubbles from the air stone mess with a sea star? You know, I have seen some starfish do some nutty stuff. And I remember I was looking at somebody's tank. I can't remember where I was. And he had like an airline going down into the back corner of the tank near the airflow box. And it was just blowing up bubbles. And there was a starfish at the top, and he was just, like, hugging the bubbles. He was loving it. But uh, I think of micro bubbles, you know, really fine bubbles were being inhaled and causing the starfish to become bloated or inflated. That could be problematic for that, that animal. That animal needs to be, you know, fully saturated with water. But uh, if a starfish chooses to do that, like, for example, sometimes the starfish will go up the glass, like in Finding Nemo, and it'll hang its arms out at the surface and it's like it's like its stomach or its mouth is exposed to the air and you're like what's going on what are you doing buddy you know you're like petting it <laughs> i mean it, it's kind of weird right but uh you know then it later goes back down into the reef where it belongs so no i don't think it's a major concern but uh i wouldn't do it on purpose you know i wouldn't uh, push it that way uh, Mike's Coral Reef says you should sell subscriptions. Well, I mean, the subscription thing for Coral Magazine is built into the magazine. If you get an issue, inside is a card, and you can just fill it out and do it, or you can just go to the website and buy it. I just thought if I put a few issues in the website where people can buy it, then they could read one for themselves and say, you know what, I do need this, and they'll buy it. Let's see. Uh, Big Three Reefing says, I have four Kessel A360s on a seven-foot tank, eight inches off the water. Um, the placement of the four lights do cover the tank, but I want to go with a mixed reef, so maybe I should go with six. Yeah, I could see you increasing it, or maybe because you've got these four, it might be nice if you could get yourself a couple of the 360Xs and intersperse them between the others to like fill in the lacking area maybe put them more toward the back or more toward the front, you know, to kind of like fill in it, like almost like a W. And you may discover, you know, that you really like the newer ones. Uh, the 360s, they're okay. I, I'm not in love with that light fixture. But the 360X, awesome. <laughs> I've always loved the look of them. They're just amazing. They apparently don't have a problem with overheating. They have the ability now to be Bluetooth controlled with your phone. So, I mean, that's awesome too. And if you're trying to add more light to your tank, then I would go with the 360X. <laughs> your anchor's really trying to push me into getting some Irish whiskey over here. He says, make them deliver it to your front doorstep. You're not wrong. That is a possibility. Uh, Keith says, regarding thoughts of Singularia and SPS, have you any thoughts about Sarcophyton with SPS? Leathers and SPS don't seem to be a problem. It's the, the, uh, what the one I was talking about, the Singularia, that's the problem. That's the one coral. There's actually an article written about it, I think in Coral Mag... Uh, by uh, Eric Borneman, who wrote Coral, which is this book right here. Where is it? Oh, has my book moved? Oh, here it is, Aquarian Corals. So he wrote this book a very long time ago. It's a great book. You can probably find this on Amazon. And uh, this one, it's called Aquarian Corals, Selection, Husbandry, and Natural History. And there is a ton of pictures in here and references and knowledge and Latin. I mean, if you want to learn how to say things that no one says anymore out loud, <laughs> you can learn it in here. Um, but this book here will go into a lot of details and give you a lot of information. So uh, I got this book many years ago. This was printed, I don't know when. It's been around a long time. 2001. Wow. 19 years ago. And I know Eric. 
he and I hung out together back in the day. So, yeah. But leather coral, uh, the sarcophyton, I've never had a problem with that. I've had finger leathers inside the tank with SPS. I've had uh, devil's hand leather with SPS, no problem. All right. Andrea says you can't do less than two hours. The clock is two hours. 